On Thursday, December the 17th, 1903, the two brothers from Dayton in Ohio had flown a curious-looking air machine. Us 35 miles from Kathmandu, capital of Nepal, Hillary and Ten Singh were welcomed and congratulated by their fellow members of the expedition. Two, one, zero. We're here at the Sky Tower in Auckland, New Zealand. It's the tallest building in New Zealand. It's one of those ones that's like a big, thin cylinder, placed in the middle where people gather, and then it goes on as a spire way up into the sky. We're at 192 metres, and for some insane reason, I'm about to jump off this thing. And I think this is part of what describes us as humans. We like to do extraordinary things. We test our levels of fitness and endurance, and we've made extraordinary stuff. Who would have ever thought that huge A380 would fly? And even going back in time, we still don't know even how the pyramids were made. G'day. Hello. <laughs> Hi there, mate. This one to you there. And just spin around. So, I'm Siobhan. I'm Graham. Hello. G'day, mate. Hey, Graham. I'm Jess. Jess. G'day, Jess. Nice how you, are you? Good. How are you, more importantly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Why does anybody think this is fun? Right now, <laughs> right now, this is not fun. Not fun. No, this is not fun. Right. Shoot, I hate this. Oh, I hate this. I hate edges. My feet are going. My, I've got that tingly feeling where it's just a little bit too much. And I guess that's why we are here. It's to try and figure out why am I standing at 192 metres to throw myself off here? For pity's sake, the great Sir Edmund Hillary, he climbed Everest over 8,000 metres. And this is only 192 metres. And I guess, why do we do all this? Where does this endless desire to do stuff like this, chuck yourself off a tall building to see if you can do it, to create, to make, even to make this building, where does that all come from? Well, let's go take a look. Yeah. Mine's on. Mine's on. Ah, nearly there. Mate, this is awful. No. Try and get both feet right up on the side if you can. Oh, no, I hate this. <laughs> yeah. Here comes Graham. Three, two, one, go! Oh. Me, that was horrible. Oh. I had to stand on the edge for so long. I'm a complete blinking wreck. And then I had to do it again and again. Now I'm going to do it See all this? Oh, mate. Oh. To share a shit l'amour. To save what cool je suis. There's absolutely no way I'm jumping off that one. There's no ropes, no bungees, nothing. And I've done my jumping. But here's the deal, we're here to make a point, just like that makes a point, so I'm gonna get on with it. Or it's pointless. The Bible tells us that our desire to create comes from something way down deep, deep, deep inside of us. Obviously, this massive structure didn't happen by accident. It was planned meticulously, every bolt, every detail, every beam. So what about us? Did we accidentally happen? Genesis 1.26 says that God created man. He formed him from the dust of the ground, breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and man became a living being. These words make it really clear. 
God deliberately made us, intentionally, purposefully. So clearly, we matter, really, really matter to Him. So because God made human beings, we're significant. But there's more to it than that. He's put us in charge of the planet. And that means there's a whole lot more purpose to this thing that we call life. But wait, there's more. Oh yes, there's more. We were not only made on purpose for a reason, but we were also made differently to everything else in all of creation. This bird is amazing, but it's not a human. We humans are different. The Bible suggests we are made in the image of the Creator God. Here it is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And simply put, that means of everything, everywhere, we're the most like him. We're the most like him of everything on the planet. And that means an interesting thing. If we learn more about him, we're going to learn more about ourselves because we're made in his image. Because we're made in his image, he loves it when we make things. The technology to roll this steel, the skill needed to make these rivets, and then the skill and care taken to make this structure so that it stands for years to come. Even the brilliance of knowing how to make the paint to keep the rust away. Why do we do these things, want to do them, insist on doing them? Well, the Bible seems to be saying it's because we're made in God's image. We like to create, we like to work at things, because work is a key component of who we are. God made us different to the rest of the animal kingdom. Chimpanzees have been using sticks to get ants for food, to the best of our knowledge, for thousands of years. And we'll still be doing so in hundreds more years. Not a spoon, not a trowel, a stick. Little progress, still a stick. Birds have been singing their magnificent songs for centuries. Absolutely beautiful, stunning music. And we humans can sing too, magnificently, if you like this kind of thing. But we're doing a lot more than just singing. We've designed all these instruments. And then we write the music that organises them into this fantastically coordinated symphony. And every element of this show has been designed and created by us. From the lighting, to the sound system, to the microphones, the guitars, the amps, and the music itself. Like birds, we love to sing, but what makes us different is that we love to create, to design, and to make all these extra things, and continually strive to make more. Because? Because we're made in the image of our maker, made in the image of God. But is that all we do? This famous sculpture, The Thinker, by Auguste Rodin, was intended by him to represent the Italian poet Dante, sitting at the gates of hell and pondering the afterlife as described in his famous poem, The Inferno.
Being made in the image of God, we're thinkers. And oh, man, do we think. Just like this sculpture here so utterly eloquently portrays. We think about what might have been, we think about what could be, what can be, what has been. Reflecting, the ability to reflect, of looking back, looking forwards, looking into the past with joy, with regret, looking forwards with hope. This ability to observe ourselves outside of ourselves. And we think, we think, we review. And look at this guy. This is where Rodin's magic was. He's just caught in between all of this. And the pose, the body, everything is just showing us this capturing. It's, it's so eloquently perfect. And that, that one thing, that thing about being caught in between, that's exactly what makes us different from animals. We all know that animals don't actually behave like this, dancing and playing instruments like we do, which is why we find this character intriguing. We also know that they don't write movies or make movies. Our intelligence, our way of thinking, is very different to the rest of the animals. Because unlike all the rest of creation, we are made in the image of God. One of the greatest gifts that we have as humans, made in the image of God, is the pleasure we draw from relationships. At our very core, we're relational beings, deeply relational. We get so much delight from simply being together. And we get more than just enjoyment, actually. Relationships aren't just fun, they're core to our well-being and survival. Deep down, we know that we're not self-sufficient. We need our family, our friends, for love, for affirmation, to keep us in line. That's just the way we're wired. The famous philosopher said, no man is an island. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. None of us are designed to be alone. Why? Because we're made in the image of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, relational beings. Another difference between us and animals is around the idea of choice. And funnily enough, animals make choices. They can, um, well, I don't know, cow, for instance, can choose to eat this bit of grass or that bit of grass. But because we're made in the image of God, our creator, we've got this whole other layer going on on top. We've got this extra dimension which says this is a right choice or a wrong choice or a good choice or a bad choice. For the sake of convenience, we call that sense that's driving that, conscience. But we all know what that is. It's the thing that all of us have got deep down inside of us that says, this is right, that's wrong. We have a whole host of extra things. We think about concepts like obligations. Like I should do so and so. I should not do that. Virtue, value choice, right, wrong, regret. All of these are far more nuanced than just straightforward on-off choices that animals might make. Sometimes these choices, choices of right or wrong, moral choices, 
come at unexpected moments and don't always wait until we're adults. We're here in the Angie Secondary School high in the hills of Rwanda in Central Africa because of a story of an extraordinary human courage. In theory, the genocide here between Hutu and Tutsi had finished some three years previously, but bands of Hutu militia were still roaming freely around in the countryside, coming through the hills and out of the forests. Three years after the supposed end of the genocide, three heavily armed militiamen burst into one of the classrooms here one night while the students were doing extra lessons. And they did exactly what you would expect. The militiamen said to the students, Hutu's this side, Tutsi's the other. And a young girl, Chantal, looked them in the eye and said, no, we don't call ourselves Hutu or Tutsi. We're all Rwandans. This made them mad. They threatened the kids. Said again, Hutu's this side, Tutsi's this side. A young boy, Silvestri, said, we don't use those labels. We are all Rwandans. We've already told you. This infuriated the militiamen and they opened fire, killing six of them, Chantal and Silvestri among them. And they mutilated some of the others that were still alive. Every February 1st in Rwanda is Heroes Day. And these six teenagers are remembered for their extraordinary courage. For a recent Heroes Day, a Rwandan journalist wrote these words. Let me read them to you. These were just teenagers. But when they were put to the test, they chose unity over division, sacrifice over selfishness. If these teenagers could do it, I don't see why the rest of us can't. Now, the school we will continue to teach. Good. Today, all the teachers, we, we teach the unity and reconciliation between students. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What we've just seen is an example of two very different moral choices. The rebel militia made one choice, and the children made a very different one. And there are countless stories of humans doing things like this, making moral decisions that are not always for our own benefit. It's what makes us different from animals. Let's let one of the world's leading authorities explain this more fully. Professor Robert Sapolsky is an expert in the field of neurological science. Interestingly enough, for both primates and humans, he studied baboons in East Africa for over 30 years. In a lecture entitled, Are Humans Just Another Primate?, where he argued strongly that we are indeed not monkeys, Professor Sapolsky, a self-professed atheist, used another story to tell of our incredible ability to make powerful moral choices. He chose the example of a Catholic nun, Sister Helen Prejean. In his lecture, Dr Sapolsky used the example of Sister Helen Prejean and her selfless acts in the face of impossible situations, and sometimes impossible people. Sister Prejean was made famous by the movie Dead Man Walking, which showed how she had offered selfless love to two hardened and unrepentant criminals on death row in Louisiana State Penitentiary. And when she was asked why she did this, Sister Helen always had exactly the same answer. The less forgivable the act, the more it needs to be forgiven. The less lovable the person, the more necessary that they are loved. And for Sapolsky, he called it the most irrational and yet glorious moment of what makes us humans. And simply put, it's this. Our ability to act morally, to make moral choices, moral decisions, to see the need in somebody else and to selflessly choose to answer that need, whether it's responded to or not, to just make that choice simply for the other person.
He's in position, I can see his head. Oh, listen to him. <laughs> As parents, we've raised two children, both of them young adults now. This is one of them. And we're dead proud of them. And I remember when they were little and we'd look at them and they'd do things, say things, sometimes that we wish they wouldn't say in front of people that we wish they hadn't done it in front of. But we'd look at them and go, Oh, how cute. They're just like us. And so you hear phrases like chip off the old block or spitting image. And those are really true because he is a chip off the old block. He is the spitting image of me. He says things, does things exactly like I do. And I love him because of it. He's my boy. Mate. On you, mate. Imagine if the Bible story is true. Well, that would mean that I'm an image bearer too. It would mean that I've been made intentionally, deliberately, that we're no accident. And because we've been made different, God loves us more than we can ever imagine. Of course he does, we're his offspring. We matter more to him than anything else in the whole world. And in anybody's language, that spells significant. Because of that, it means we can wake up in the morning content to just be who we are, humans, made by God, deliberately, intentionally. He loves us. He cares for us. He's treated us as very significant. He's put us in charge of the whole planet. Me? An image bearer? You mightn't think so.